US credit markets are starting to look a little bit shaky. Now this has implications for investors everywhere because as we've seen in the past, if US credit conditions deteriorate, it affects all markets. So in this video, we look at the reasons behind that, the evidence for it, but also consider the implications for investors and the opportunities it creates. This video is sponsored by Shortform, which creates super-powered book summaries. So let's look at whether the US credit bubble is popping in a bit more detail. So what do we mean when we say that credit conditions have deteriorated? Well, one way to measure that is simply to count the number of companies which have failed to repay debt on their bonds. If that happens, the company is said to be in default. Now, previously, if we look back about a year, you could count the number of defaults on the fingers of two hands. But what's happened recently for the first two quarters of 2023 is that in the US in particular, the number of defaults has spiked upwards. Now, that's not true of the other regions which you can see on this graph. It's not true in Europe, in emerging markets, or other regions globally. It is a US problem. If we focus on just the lowest credit quality companies, these are speculative credits as they're called, you can see the default rate, which is the proportion of bonds which have defaulted, has certainly spiked upwards as well. But this spike isn't finished yet. So for example, if you look at S&P Global Ratings forecast for one year ahead, it thinks that default rate is going to increase to 4.25% by May of 2024. And that's what it calls its base case, which is a kind of central case, certainly not a worst case scenario. European credit, in contrast, is only going to reach around 3.6% at the same point in time. Here, for example, you can see that Mohamed El Aryan, who's a global strategist and economist, has said that he thinks that there's going to be a massive refinancing risk over the course of the next year. Now, what we're talking about here is a refinancing shock. As debt matures, you have to roll it over. You have to issue new debt to replace it. And when you do that, now that interest rates are much higher, it's going to be a shock to those companies because they have to pay much higher rates of interest. Now, as we'll see later, the commercial real estate market, that's what the letters CRE stand for in this headline, will also start to deteriorate. In fact, we've already started to see that happen. So really what we're seeing is that the Federal Reserve's monetary tightening and tightening from other banks across the world is having a delayed cooling effect on credit markets and this could cause secondary problems. Now it helps to see the size of various markets just to get an idea of context. The US property market for residential real estate is around $56 trillion in the US. It's a huge market. The treasury market is about $24 trillion and the commercial real estate market is about the same size. So these would be things like shopping malls, but it would also include infrastructure. Now, a lot of that is funded via loans. And if these loans go bad due to rent not being paid on some of that commercial real estate, then that could cause problems for banks. So what often happens if you have problems in one sector, particularly a huge one like the commercial real estate sector, is that it can spill over into other sectors like the banking sector. And that could have a cooling effect on the entire economy. If we just focus on corporate debt, these are bonds issued by companies in the US, we can split it into two groups. Investment grade is the highest credit quality companies and then high yield are the speculative credits. They have a lower credit quality and a higher probability of default. And if we look at the size of those two markets, you can see the investment grade universe is about $7 trillion and the speculative high yield market is about $1.7 trillion. Another form of credit is leveraged loans, and these have been growing very rapidly, but they're only about $1.4 trillion in size for that entire market. So all of these sectors, these markets, would be considered part of the US credit market, and some of them are starting to look a little bit disheveled. Now, as an investor, what we care about is how much we're paid to take credit risk, and this is called a credit spread. Now, fortunately, there are various credit rating agencies which rate debt according to how likely it is to default. And broadly, we can split it into those two categories. We've got investment grade, also called high grade, and that's for a credit rating which is anywhere between AAA, the highest credit rating, down to BBB, which is the lowest rating within investment grade. Then we go down one notch and we get into junk territory. This is also called high yield, 
or speculative grade credit. Now, the lower you go down this credit rating spectrum, the more you'd be expected to be paid to take the credit risk of those companies. So always when you're considering whether to buy corporate bonds or a bond fund, you should be thinking, am I being paid enough to take this risk? So if we compare the yield on speculative bonds and investment grade bonds, what we'll see is that you can decompose it into different components. Both of them consist of the risk-free rate. That's roughly what you'd get with treasuries, US treasuries, which have almost no credit risk. And then on top of that, we layer the credit spread, which itself has two components. One component is compensation for taking the credit risk, the risk that you're not going to get your money back. And the other component is for illiquidity. Some high yield bonds, for example, trade very infrequently. And when the market turns south, trading just shuts down for that market. So you also have to be compensated for taking that illiquidity risk. And it's often a big component of the overall credit spread which you're paid. So let's take a look right now at what the credit spreads are for the European and the US markets. Now we'll focus on the junk bond market, the speculative grade credit. And what's quite shocking is that given the deterioration in credit, we haven't seen an increase in the compensation that people receive as investors. Credit spreads are still very tight, and if anything, seem to be tightening further. So for example, in the United States, credit spreads are about 3.8%. In Europe, they're around 4.2%. And by historic standards, that's a pretty tight spread. If we go back to the time of the pandemic sell-off, you can see that the US credit spreads blew out to over 10%. That's until the Fed stepped in and started buying some of that junk bond debt. So if we look at three ETFs in the United States and track them over time since 2020, you can see how things have panned out since the pandemic. The junk bond ETF, HYG, sold off hugely by around over 20% when there was a big sell-off in corporate bond markets, but also in the stock market. But then as the Fed stepped in, it actually bought that ETF, HYG, and credit rallied very hard. Investment grade credit didn't sell off as much because that's higher credit quality, but it certainly did sell off during the 2020 fall in credit markets. But it also recovered very quickly as the Fed stepped in. And Treasuries rallied during the course of that sell-off. So if we look at the IEF fund, which is a kind of intermediate duration US Treasury fund, that rallied quite a bit. But then since the beginning of 2022, what we've seen is that risk-free rates have increased. That means that Treasury sold off. It also means investment grade bonds sold off and junk bonds sold off too. So the two reasons why corporate bonds sell off is because risk-free rates increase, as we've seen recently, but also because credit spreads widen which we haven't seen yet. So I think there could be another leg downwards for high yield credit, and that would be because of a credit spread widening in response to deterioration of the credit conditions and a higher default rate. And as we'll see later, that could create opportunities for us as investors. Now, I like to read around when it comes to investment books, and short form's an incredible tool when I do that. That's because it allows me to not just see book summaries, which save me a lot of time, it also allows me to see the context of the knowledge contained within the book. It often represents alternative points of view, or perhaps it'll quote from other books which deal with the same knowledge for the book you're reading. Also, it doesn't stop me buying the book itself. If there's a book I really enjoy in the short form summary, then I will go out and buy it. But it also allows me to remember the key points from the book after I've finished reading it. So you can see it has the one page summary so that you can very quickly see the key points in the book. But then it also has very detailed summaries of the concepts from the book. And then that integration feature, which I was talking about, in this case, it's really interesting. What they do is they turn around the question and they say, how do you avoid building an Enron if you're building your own company? And they go through a kind of checklist for bad practices to avoid. Now, the books that Shortform deals with are non-fiction books. And of course, my favourite topic would be money and finance. But I'm also interested in topics in economics, business, but even psychology, because I know that affects investment decisions. They also publish articles on things which are in the news or which are just generally interesting. Shortform also comes with a browser extension at no extra cost, 
which allows you to take any article that you're looking at in your browser and summarize it into bullet points. So here it is in my browser extensions, and you can see it's made a very detailed point-by-point -point summary of the article. But of course, being short form, it goes beyond that, and it creates this context section, which explains the broader picture behind the Wirecard scandal, how it's one of the biggest accounting frauds in German history. But also things about the role of auditors in maintaining the integrity of reporting companies. In addition to that, it has links so that you can learn more about the topics behind the article. So for example, here's an article from Reuters. And it presents counter arguments which present the other side of the story. And at the bottom, if there's any related short form content, it'll show you where it is and give you a link to it. Now, as a viewer of Pension Craft, you get a 25% discount to your premium annual subscription, and you can access that by going to the URL shortform.com slash pensioncraft. You'll find that in the description, or alternatively, you can just scan this QR code. Now, that refinancing risk that Mohammed El Arian was referring to is often called a maturity wall. Now, if we look at how much junk bond issuance there's been, this is the companies which have low credit quality in the United States issuing debt year by year, you can see there was pretty brisk issuance until we reach 2022, when the entire issuance market collapsed. That's because interest rates got much higher, so companies stopped issuing debt because it just made it more expensive. That means that we've essentially started a clock, a ticking time bomb for some of these companies, where they wait until their current debt matures, and then they have to roll it over by issuing new debt. And that will be a shock. Servicing that debt will be much more expensive. Another problem is that the maturity of this debt which has been issued has got much shorter. So the ticking time bomb has a much shorter fuse. So if we look at the average maturity of US high yield bonds, you can see that it's gradually been falling since the early 1990s and it's currently at very low levels of about five years. So on average, US high yield companies won't be able to stick it out for more than five years until they have to roll over their debt and get this refinancing shock. So when will this maturity wall hit? Well, it's going to be within five years as we saw, but if we break it down according to issuance over the last five years, you can see a lot of the issuance was during the pandemic. That's the gray box you can see here. And over the next three years, we're going to have just under $700 billion worth of this debt maturing. This in turn means that these companies are probably going to have a refinancing shock and a lot of them won't make it. So what we'd expect to see is a pickup in default rates. Now, of course, we all knew this was coming because the Fed's been deliberately trying to create tighter credit conditions. One of the ways in which they measure that is to talk to regional banks and to ask them whether they're creating tighter credit conditions or loosening credit conditions. And this is published in their senior loan officers survey. So when this looks red in the graphs beside me, you can see that credit conditions are tightening. Banks are making it more difficult for companies to borrow. When it goes blue, it means credit conditions are easing. And what we've seen recently is a very sharp tightening of credit conditions. And that's both for small and medium sized companies but also for large US companies. So no matter which way US companies turn, credit conditions are getting tighter, funding costs are increasing, and there's gonna be a refinancing shock at some point. And not all companies are going to make it through that shock. The problem's going to be exacerbated by what I call a downgrade cascade. If we break down the US credit market according to the credit ratings of the individual bonds, you can see what that looks like here beside me. Now, this is just non-financial debt. This doesn't include debt from banks. And I've split it up into investment grade and high yield debt. Now, if we look at the investment grade part, what's worrying is that the vast majority of it is in triple B. That's just one notch above junk. So if any of these bonds gets downgraded, they'll go from investment grade and they'll jump down into that junk bond category. Now that's a problem. Now we've seen that a lot of companies are going to have to roll over their debt. That'll increase their debt financing costs and that's going to have a negative effect on their profit. That in turn means that they're likely to get downgraded by the credit rating agencies. Now because so many of those companies are just on the cusp of investment grade, they're going to become fallen angels as they're called. Companies which used to be investment grade but which are now high yield. 
Now, if you're somebody that runs an investment grade debt fund like LQD, then you won't be allowed to own those bonds. You're going to be a full seller of the debt of that company. That means that the credit spread for that company will widen very sharply. For sellers always create these horrible market dislocations. That in turn means that the debt replacement cost is going to get even higher for those companies and in turn their probability of default will increase and we'll get this downward spiral of more downgrades and then a higher default rate. So the fact that we've got so much investment grade debt at that lowest notch of investment grade, triple B, is going to probably exacerbate this downgrade cycle. Now, loan losses are starting to pick up in the United States, but it's not the same everywhere. So, for example, if we look at residential mortgages in the United States, default rates there are just not picking up yet, despite the much higher funding costs. That's probably because in the US, you can quite easily have a 30-year mortgage, which is fixed rate. So all you have to do is stay in the same house and you won't have to worry about higher rates. However, what we are starting to see is a pickup in credit card defaults. Now that suggests that a lot of the precautionary savings that people built up during the pandemic are now being exhausted. And not only exhausted, but they're having to spend on credit cards and it turns out an increasing number of people are unable to pay their credit card bills. Now the US economy depends on consumers spending and if they are running out of money and running out of credit facilities, then that's going to have a cooling effect on consumer spending. That's worrying for US growth. It's also worrying for many US companies which rely on that spending. Commercial real estate is another market which is heavily dependent on credit. Here again, we can break down this market into two components. One of them is owner-occupied. The other one is non-owner-occupied, where the interest payments are created by rental income. Now, notice that the non-performing loans are picking up in the non-owner-occupied segment. Now, a lot of these loans have been created by regional banks. So there's a worry that this regional banking crisis, which seemed to have come to a stop earlier this year, may start to go into overdrive again due to these commercial real estate loans. But it's not just regional banks which are on the hook for these CRE loans. Many of the largest banks, because they have a bigger lending book, are also on the hook. And there also we've started to see an increase in these non-performing loans where the payments are overdue by more than 90 days, say. The difference, of course, is that these large banks have stronger balance sheets and they're more likely to be able to survive higher non-performing loans. But again, the consequence here is that if credit conditions are deteriorating, then banks will have to be more careful about the loans which they make and credit conditions will tighten further. In turn, that means that the companies which depend most heavily on that credit will see their profit growth slow down and that'll weigh on their stock prices too. So what are the consequences for us as investors? Well, the first consequence, I think, is an opportunity. One of the things that's been in my market crash shopping list for some time is US high yield credit. And there's just been no good opportunity to buy it at a high yield. Here I've plotted the trailing 12 month yield. That's the income generated over the last 12 months in the form of dividends divided by the price of the fund for HYG. During the big sell off in the credit market, during the credit crisis, this yield spiked upwards to over 12%. Currently, as you can see, it's below 6%. So if that creeps upwards to around 8% or even 9%, that would be a great entry point into the US high yield market. So that's definitely on my radar. If credit spreads do widen, prices for these junk bond funds will fall, and I think that could be a really good entry point. In the equity space, perhaps a tilt towards quality would be a good idea at this point if you think the credit spreads are going to widen and the credit problems will get worse. So for example, if you look at this MSCI USA Quality Index, which is tracked by many ETFs, you can see that one of its three criteria for quality is low financial leverage. In other words, companies which don't depend heavily on debt for their growth. I'd expect such companies to outperform in an environment where credit conditions are getting worse. And indirectly, funds which buy those companies, such as the ETFs which track this index. An S&P also breaks down US sectors according to which ones have the greatest number of companies which are at risk of being downgraded. So this is kind of like a forward-looking measure 
of credit deterioration. And you can see the sectors which are at the top here are consumer products, but also telecommunications companies and aerospace and defense companies and automotive companies. Notice that oil and gas are at the bottom of the list. So if you are choosing your sectors, you probably want ones which won't fall in the epicenter of the credit problems if they do materialize. Now, if the US credit bubble does pop, I think the greatest opportunity it's going to create is the ability to buy US stocks at a reasonable valuation. That's something we haven't seen for some time, not since 2020. Now, that could increase your long-term returns. Now, that's not a good reason to hold back money from the market waiting for the credit bubble to pop. If you are earning money, then saving it and investing it, you should just carry on doing that. But if you have got a big lump sum to invest, this could create an opportunity to accelerate your drip feed into the US market. So I hope this has shown you which measures to look out for, the senior loan officers survey, credit spreads, but also the performance of that HYG fund to gauge whether the US credit market is starting to get a bit more shaky. Also, don't forget our offer from Shortform. You get a 25% discount if you use our promotional code. And as always, Thank you for listening.